Otis, Blackouts and Codswallop. The story of West Street told in 10 objects. Presented by John Mount. My first slide is William Leonard Grant's letter. It is not the contents of the letter that are important, but the letter's very existence after more than 100 years. It may well be the only surviving letter in his own hand. William Grant was an important mid-19th century figure. He was an architect. He designed many of the town's buildings, including the Roman Catholic Church, Key Cole Hospital, Kemsley Paper Mill, the old swimming baths in the Baths, and the quirky 61 West Street, along with the Baptist Church, which was 1 High Street West. The letter itself, the contents, are simply a request asking for a cheque to be paid half yearly on one of his rental properties. The original Baptist Church was the first building in West Street and was built by Luke Phillips in 1866. It held 500 worshippers and there was provision for a gallery. The west side of the chapel ran along Denmark Road, uh, which is still there today. It was half owned by the chapel and Percy Hubbard, a local businessman, and provided access to a schoolroom extension at the rear of the chapel. W. G. Matthews observed in his journey through Sittingbourne, next came the somewhat small Baptist church or chapel. In front of the chapel was a forecourt with an iron fence and there was a porch leading into the chapel. It is now 1887 and nearly 20 years later. The congregation had outgrown the original chapel building. William Leonard Grant was commissioned to design plans for a larger building. He embarked on a grand design including a gallery, circular windows, a roof lantern, gas lighting and a new pulpit. He painted the 1887 picture, clearly a man of many talents. In the painting, on the west side is the manse. In front of that, iron railings which were recycled from the original chapel. And to the right are a row of terraced houses, uh, which is probably Park Road. In 1896 the manse was demolished to make way for new buildings abutting the whole length of the 1887 church. In 1897 the new church opened with classrooms and a minister's vestry. It cost £1,760 and is much the same as today's church. This is a reprint of the 1882 Kelly's Directory of Kent and the section showing the entry for the Baptist Church. Today its postal address is High Street Sittingbourne, a throwback to the past when it was 1 High Street West, so now strictly it should be 1 West Street but the church thinks it is one high street. This is a blacked out bicycle lamp. I mentioned Denmark Road in an earlier slide. This thoroughfare led to the back entrance of 9 West Street, which was Schoon's cycle shop, and he may well have had an object like this in his workshop. But this model is probably the military version of the black coloured civilian bicycle lamp although sometimes they were grey. In World War II, the blackout affected how people could see to get around if they were travelling in the dark, so bicycle and vehicle lights were dimmed. The upper part of the front lamp glass must be completely obscured. This is a poster, and it illustrates the requirements for dimming bicycle lamps. The front lamp the upper half of the glass and the whole side or rear panels must be completely obscured. For the rear lamp must be a single aperture, one inch circle, visible from 30 yards but not 300 yards. And on the mud guard there must be a white patch so as to be seen more easily from the ground. This shows a black type bicycle lamp 
attached to a bicycle. This is the section of the 1897 Ordnance Survey map. Denmark Street is to the west of the Baptist Tabernacle. Origi originally three buildings erected between 1866 and 1871 numbered 3, 5 and 7. The middle building was number 5 and it was later divided into two and the cottages renumbered 3, 5, 7 and 9. The latter was known as Bourne House. This is a 1960s photograph and it confirms the presence of three original buildings and there is a plaque on the wall identifying Bourne House which houses Schoon's cycle shop. Abraham Sidney Schoon's was born in 1878 and came from Raynham. Before coming to Sittingbourne he worked as a brickfield labourer and then as a butcher. In Sittingbourne he trained as an apprentice cycle engineer with George Hooker at 26 West Street. This was his lifelong vocation. As a young man, Sidney was the first man to drive a motor car from Coventry to Sittingbourne. When his apprenticeship ended, he moved into space at the back of 9 West Street. He built the first hybrid vehicle, which was a three-wheeled vehicle and a cross between a bicycle and a car. The first car in Sittingbourne was a four-seater Benz with a 3.5 horsepower engine and it was sold by Sydney Schoons. He moved into the main part of Bourne House in 1908 where he established his cycle shop. There was a, a, an advertisement in the 1910 edition of the East Kent Gazette and it said S. Schoons, cycle manufacturer, just moved to more commodious premises at 9 West Street new machines built to order, but more worryingly he was granted a license to store petrol on the premises. Sydney continued his business through the war and it was still going strong in the early 1960s at the time of his death. My next object is a bracelet watch which was very 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 popular between the wars. It is a lady's gold bracelet watch which was made in Switzerland um, during the 1930s. So it was on sale in Sittingbourne in 1935. It has Arabic numerals, is either gold plated or rolled gold and has 17 jewels. It is anti-magnetic. It was made by the Doric Watch Company Switzerland and has a stainless steel back and it was very popular so sold cheaply but you can still find one today on eBay for about £30. Now this bracelet watch is associated with number 21 West Street where it was on sale and it is the story of Ernest Ewart Gladstone Dryland which I'm going to tell. He was born in 1882, his father was a shoemaker and he became an apprentice watch and clockmaker and, la and latterly a repairer of jewellery. His army medical report um, described him as fit, not overweight, but of poor eyesight, surely a disadvantage for a watchmaker. He married Gertrude Hancocks from Sittingbourne in 1907, but continued working in Gillingham for a bit. He moved with his family to Sittingbourne in 1934 to 21 West Street and stayed until 1938 before moving to Coventry to be near his daughter's home. Number 21 was unoccupied at the beginning of the war. Before moving on, I'd just like to say that I have checked for living relatives in this area and there are none in the available records and the reason for this will shortly become apparent because a bombshell was soon to appear in one of the local papers. The newspaper in question was the Birmingham Daily Post dated the 22nd of January 1962. It said, A Coventry magistrate on Saturday refused to grant bail to Ernest Ewart Gladstone Dryland, age 80, a retired watch repairer who was charged with the murder of his wife 
Mrs. Gertrude Dryland, also 80. He was initially remanded, remanded in custody. So with these combination of names, there is no doubt that the Ernest Dryland from Citybourne is one in the same person. The couple were married for more than 50 years. Mrs. Dryland was found to have been suffocated with a cellophane bag placed over her head. At this point, Ernest was not allowed bail. But there were mitigating circumstances. Mrs. Dryland had a severe heart condition. Ernest's daughter, Pearl, testified that her mother's health had gradually deteriorated over the years. Her father was exhausted and could no longer look after her. This tragic story was in fact what we would call today a mercy killing, but by an honourable man at the end of his tether. Ernest died of natural causes a week later. My next slide shows numbers 19 and 21 West Street as they are today in the year 2020. The next object uh, from West Street is a silver plated teapot. It was manufactured by Gladwin of Sheffield and is EPNS silver plated. The Gladwin Company was located at the Montgomery Works in Sheffield between 1921 and 1925. It then moved to the Embassy Works also in Sheffield between 1926 and 1936. It specialised in quality hotel and catering wares. But this teapot looks like Art Deco in style, so fits in with the manufacturing date. The teapot was given to Anne Sefton's grandmother, Joan Parrish, when she worked for Mr Woodman of Borden Lane. He and his housekeeper had set up a cafe in West Street, opposite Pullins in the 1950s. This was called the Old Wheel Cafe. The teapot came from this cafe and so is around 70 years old. The cafe was at 25 West Street, which in the 19th century used to be a blacksmith's forge. The cafe was very difficult to locate as there are no entries in the usual records, directories etc. It was identified from an East Kent Gazette advert from 1952 and then confirmed by some members of our research group who remembered a cafe in West Street with a wooden wheel propped up against one wall, hence the name. In the early 1960s it was bought by Paul and Beryl Cook and Paul has filled in many more details about the cafe. Paul and Beryl, Beryl ran CP Studios in East Street. 25 West Street became CP Studios, taken from the surnames of Paul Cook and Beryl Pritchard. The cafe was a well-established eatery seating about 50 people. Both the cafe and photographic business ran side by side from the same premises. The stalwart of the cafe was Mrs Grady, who had a fascination for stockpiling strawberry jellies. Described by Paul as a foul substance, but adored by customers. During busy times, for example Saturday mornings, staff from the photography room were called upon to act as waitresses. The cafe was very popular, particularly among the ladies of the town, whose ear-splitting cacophony of noise was, according to Paul, equal to all the parrot houses in creation. So it was a great disappointment when the cafe closed. 25 West Street continued as a photographic business and was run for many years by Chris Deemer until the shop closed in 2006. Today it is an estate agent's. I next come to the convent school straw boater. Now a boater is a formal summer hat introduced originally for men in the late 19th century. It is made of stiff straw and has a stiff flat crown and brim, typically with a striped ribbon around the crown. Called boaters as they were popular summer headgear for boating or sailing. A school version was introduced in the late 19th century and was much flatter with a very low crown. It was not made to measure but was secured with cords. The hat conferred a certain social status on the school and was popular in private and public schools but also some grammar schools. It was considered a cut above other schools 
students did not like the bota and often used it as a frisbee and ritually burned them on the last day of turn. Convent girls using the train to Shebby used to throw their hats out of the train's window, but most schools abandoned the hat in the 1970s, but not the convent. The convent of the Nativity School was 51 West Street, and I'm going to concentrate on the development of the school over the years. Now the school opened in 1895 and closed in 1993. The full account is in my book about the story of the convent published by the museum. Called Shamel, after the medieval hermitage that once stood on the site, the house was built by solicitor Frederick Gibson. It was sold to the ladies of the Nativity of Our Lord, a persecuted French order of teaching nuns in 1894. The school opened a year later for young ladies and later young boys. The school was popular and with rising pupil numbers, more space was clearly needed. The new teaching block with extra classrooms, a dining room, nuns accommodation and dormitories was built in 1904. The numbers continued to increase throughout the 1920s and the 1930s and plans were made for further expansion, but they were put on hold due to the intervention of World War II, during which school boarders were evacuated to Abington, which was then in the county of Berkshire. After the war, restrictions were lifted and the prep for the new junior school got underway. The slide on the left uh, shows the ground being prepared for junior school, taking into account a 30-foot restriction from Ufton Lane which was imposed by the council, whilst the picture on the right was what it looked like when it was completed in 1948 and with its distinctive L-shaped profile. The junior school was self-contained. It was built strong enough to bear two additional stories with further development in mind. The two new stories were added in the 1960s, providing more classrooms and a library. The shape of the junior school is clearly seen, above which is the metal framework for the new stories. On the right hand side shows the completed school. And just to note that there is an additional wing to the right of the 1904 teaching block. This contained the school hall and further classrooms. Its forerunner was erected around the same time as the 1904 teaching block, but it was gradually expanded and extended. This is the profile of the school, which was readily recognised by the people of Sittingbourne. It was reduced to rubble in 1993, two years short of the school centenary. In modern day terms, the site was too small to establish a new state school, but if it had been say 10 years later, it might have been considered for, for an existing school's annex or a sixth form college, but who knows. But with modern progress, the school was replaced by a small housing estate, with the names of the roads and the buildings derived in memory of the school and its headmistress. This is Wingate House, named after a stalwart of the school, Sister Anselm Wingate, who was headmistress for half a century between 1933 and 1983 when she retired. Her life and contribution to the school is detailed in my convent book. My next object is the Codneck Bottle, which is associated with number 67 West Street. It was devised by Hiram Codd, who was a mechanical en engineer, because in the early 20th century it was very difficult to maintain water under pressure in portable vessels. He patented this design for a bottle that used a marble and a rubber gasket to seal the beverage within. His bottle used the effervescent pressure of the mineral itself to force a marble against a rubber washer in the upper ring of the neck of the bottle, and it made a durable seal. The pinched neck held the marble when the bottle was tilted for drinking the water, and it was resealed by vigorous shaking, turning the bottle upside down to force the marble back into its closure position. The invention is over 100 years old and is low technology, but today it is still used in India and Japan. The codneck bottle is said to have given rise to a well-known phrase, it's a load of cold swallop, reflecting the poor, poor quality of the beer it once held. The Creamer brothers, George and Josiah, grew up in Sittingbourne and moved to 67 and 69 West Street at the turn of the 20th century from the High Street. Josiah managed the bakery and George looked after the grocery. 
creamer had his own bottles made and with his name on and they had their own bottling plant uh, which was at 74 High Street and the bottles probably contained ginger beer which was sold to Brickfield workers. By 1917 the shop had been sold to Harry Carpenter who no doubt was open all hours. The grocery shop at number 67 was there until well into the 1960s. It was run by Edward and Irene Barrow. When they left, one of David Manuel's sons ran both the bakery and the grocery until 1984. The Manuels were a well-known business family in West Street. David ran a cooked meat shop at number 48 and Alice ran a tea shop at number 24. Sadly, she was killed on the bombing raid in West Street during World War II. My next object is a carte de visit or an early business or calling card. The lady who is sitting poses with an uncomfortable fixed stare, necessary because the sitter had to sit perfectly still and not blinking for up to two minutes. Now when dating these cards there are various clues to be considered. The rounded corners, the size of 2.5 by 4 and a quarter inches, symbol ed edge with no crenulation, card thickness and its neutral colour. Now all these attributes and the hairstyle of the lady and her clothes style, plus the imprints on front and back, date this car between 1870 and 1890. But of course all this work could have been avoided by turning over the card and observing the imprint 1882. So a late 19th century photograph and because of their cheapness the cards were also used for miniature portraiture. This was a card from Jacques Moles, a German, not French, photographer from Chatham. His studio was at 34 West Street, which was first occupied in 1861 by George Bassett, who was an auctioneer appraiser. In 1888 he sold the studio to Frederick Miller Rammel. Now the cabinet print was a much larger photograph measuring 6 and a quarter by 4 and 1 eighth inches and these were popular pre-World War I. Both this and the previous print were called albumin prints which required a large number of egg whites to form the surface emulsion. This photograph dates from Rammel's early years as a photographer, about 1900. Frederick Miller Rammel was born in Deal and his 1908 advertisement in the Sittingbourne Street Directory states that his premises are opposite the police station, which is now Weatherspoons. Today, the property, together with number 32, is owned by William Hill, the bookmaker. My next object is a butcher's stamp. It was in fact a rubber stamp secured onto a wooden base with a hand grip attached. Rubber stamps date back to 1844 and they were designed to replace metal stamps. Rubber was cheaper. Initially the rubber was soft, sticky and floppy. No good for stamps. But Charles Goodyear, often described as a crackpot, solved the problem. In 1839, fooling around in the kitchen, he accidentally dropped some rubber mixed with sulphur onto a hot stove. Instead of a mess, the rubber cured and was flexible uh, the next day. This process was called vulcanisation after Vulcan, the Roman god of fire. He later applied this to making rubber tyres, but Goodyear, instead of making a fortune, died a pauper. For the rubber stamp, the image is inked and then applied to the paper as a print. This stamp comes from 36 West Street when it was a butcher's shop run by Frank Whitcomb between 1934 and 1967. Beef was unaffordable by ordinary people, pig meat was cheaper to rear and so it was much more cheaper to buy. There was more variety, for example you could have bacon, ham, sausages, pork pies etc. My last object is a clothes label reel. These labels were sewn inside items of clothing made by Doldrins the tailor. The material is some sort of weave including green thread for the printed part and this suggests an earlier date was certainly earlier than the 1960s. 
This is what is called a branding label, which was developed in the late 19th century commercially to identify quality products, so in those days they stood out from cheaper, mass-produced items. The advertisement alongside is from the 1927 town directory before Doldins expanded into the shop next door. The shop began in 1912 when William Dolding arrived in Sittingbourne to learn his trade at May and Sayer, the menswear shop where Superdrug now stands. William was made redundant following his marriage to Emma Taylor and together they purchased the lease to, to shops numbers 8 and 10 West Street. They traded from number 10 and rented out number 8. They had two sons, Clifford and Graham. Clifford went into the business. He married Kathleen Bishop in 1934, who was the daughter of local builders. They had two sons, Barton and Hugh, who are still alive today. They carried on after the death of their father, William. In 1987, the shop celebrated its 75th anniversary and a new shop front was installed. Initially all went well, but the economy took a turn for the worse and by the mid-1990s, extensive competition from out-of-town shopping centres and cut-price clothes retailers meant that the business went into a sharp decline, from which it never recovered. Barton Dolding, well beyond retirement age, reluctantly decided to sell the shop. In 2005, the three Dolding shops became a pub restaurant called The Vineyard. And so ends nearly 100 years of service to the town, and so does my talk. Thank you.